<clears throat> okay so uh today i would be taking a little extension from the yesterday's topic but i'll also introduce you to some easy ways of uh, starting with uh, the robotics programming using matlab okay <clears throat> okay so now are you able to see my <clears throat> presentation yes ma'am that's just well okay so this is something that we discussed yesterday on the differential drive uh, motor just a quick uh, recap on what we discussed because this is essential to go forward for today's uh, topic now one is if you know the radius of the wheel and uh, the length between the two tracks or the two wheels uh, which is represented by l and the radius is represented by r if you know both and provided you know the velocity or the i mean the linear velocity and the angular velocity uh, for the wheels again you will be able to identify or you will be able to calculate the v and omega right so these uh, this first formula we generally call it as the uh, kinematics forward kinematics where given the wheels velocity and the design constraints okay whatever uh measurements that you have uh, taken for designing the robot given all those values you will be able to identify at what speed i mean at what linear velocity and at what angular velocity the robot is actually moving this is called a forward kinematics and the reverse kinematics is you know at what linear velocity and you know at what angular velocity it keeps moving and with that you will be able to identify what is going to be in my left wheels velocity and the right wheels velocity so this equation of calculating the left wheels and right wheels velocity is actually called the inverse kinematics so forward kinematics is given the design considerations you are trying to predict the velocity and angular velocity and once it starts moving and once the robot keeps giving you the uh, right and left velocities you calculate back saying at what linear velocity and what angular velocity the robot has to move so we have both the forward kinematics and the inverse kinematics now what happens is we will be actually coming up with different types of uh, mobile robots now when it when it is uh, a fixed robot like an industrial robot that we discussed on day 1 uh, the calculations are much simpler but when the environment and when the robot uh, becomes dynamic okay when it keeps moving then it it the calculations are complex so now we will see a few more designs on uh, the robot now what you see as a difference here is we have three wheels here we call it a triple omni wheel uh, robot where in one single robot we have uh, three wheels and generally they are actually placed uh, you know uh, almost perpendicular to each other something like that so we have three axes here so we have three wheels and uh, if, if you look at the three wheels all these three wheels will have certain angular velocity right so which which means you know it it actually keeps turning each each wheel has a specific speed now what you we need to understand is all these three omni wheels are actually located radially around a circular body as you see in this figure now the most important thing is we'll have to see whether these three wheels are actually independently actuated wheels which means where they, there are three different motors and three are independently activated which means three motors are driving three wheels separately there is no relative motion 
so you're not you're not uh, one wheel is not moving based upon the movement in the second wheel so they are independent of each other if that is the case then the kinematics you know the forward kinematics equation is given as such i mean as given here now what you see here as a matrix is the homogeneous matrix that we would be getting for a triple omni wheel uh, robot so what do we understand here now we have three velocities for all the three wheels right so which is represented here as omega 1 omega 2 and omega 3 apart from this we have an angular velocity of the overall robot which means how the robot actually turns the robot will turn depending upon of course the speed of uh, each wheel right so overall orientation difference overall turning of the robot is given by omega and the linear velocities right now this can move along two axes along x and along y because we have again the three wheels which is going to help us to move in the two directions so we will have vx and vi vy which will correspond to the linear velocities along the x axis and y axis so now if you consider uh, this now we have if you take the axis here we will have alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 3 depending upon how each of these axes turns now we will be taking the angle at which uh, the each wheel actually turns uh, the entire robot into consideration so we will be taking alpha 1 and we will be taking alpha 2 and alpha 3 so the total angle deviation is actually taken and that actually forms the homogeneous transformation matrix so you don't have to really uh, by heart this or i mean it is okay to just understand that each type of robot will have totally a different uh, uh, forward kinematics and a different inverse kinematics equation so just for that understanding purpose i have given you all these equations but when it goes to your matlab uh, we we are going to download a specific toolbox which is going to support all the uh, different models that we are discussing today and we will also see how to execute it using simulink because that is that that will be more of a simulation kind where you will be able to visualize how the robot moves as well so today we will see how to apply all these using and uh, not an existing toolbox with matlab but then we are going to download it from github and then probably use it so that way most of the robots are available as an existing model in github so whatever model you want you should be able to uh, browse through it get it and see how to uh, work with it yeah and then we have a generic omni wheel kind of a robot uh the omni wheel robot is can, on, can we yeah. pa pause for 2 minutes ma'am okay sorry for the disturbance ma'am there is an error here okay Ma'am, sorry for the delay. Now you can start now. Sorry, ma'am. Okay. So yeah. Ma'am, go slowly, uh, ma'am. Sorry. Ma'am, uh, 
go slowly ma'am we are not clear about it okay so you want me to repeat uh triple omni meal ma'am okay so wh- what i meant to say here is when we discussed about the uh, robot yesterday what we had was just two wheels right so the parameters that we considered for this robot was just four different parameters now four different parameters are one is the base right the the uh, length between the two wheels the radius of the wheel the left wheel's velocity and the right wheel's velocity now these four are the main parameters that describes the robot now with these parameters we were Ma'am. trying to find Ma'am. yeah ஒருமிஷன் now today what we are trying to do is supposing i have a robot with three wheels now what what happens when you have three wheels you will have a very good motion in while you want to give a 360 degree turn okay so while while you use a two uh, wheel this is like you know a, a scooter which comes with two wheels right i mean not the normal scooter that i'm talking about uh, assuming that you know a, a scooter that comes with a side seater okay so if you have something with two wheels and assume that the robot has to make a 360 degree turn that actually will be a little difficult rather than that if you if you design a triple omni wheel robot where you have three wheels now these three wheels are going to turn at a constant you know at at some particular velocity in such a way that it becomes easy for the robot to make a 360 degree turn so there are multiple designs of a robot you can have three wheels you can have four wheels it it is up to you to design a robot but what is more important is when you have designed a robot of this kind a circular robot with three wheels then the kinematics is going to be totally different why do you need a kinematics because given the conditions or uh, given the design constraints now you will have to understand what is going to be my linear velocity and the angular velocity of the entire robot or the other hand or the other way around in the inverse kinematics given the linear velocity and the angular velocity of the vehicle or of the robot you should be able to find out what is going to be the velocity at which each of these wheel is going to move around right so when i have a three omni wheels you know triple omni wheel kind of a robot my kinematics equation is this what is kinematics equation you are trying to predict uh, velocity along x axis velocity along y axis these are going to be my linear velocities and omega is going to be my angular velocity now how do you predict it by means of you know taking the homogeneous uh, transformation matrix now all the homogeneous transformation matrix that we were discussing in the Uh, yesterday's class was not something like this it was totally different why because we were discussing for a differential drive robot now we are trying to represent it for a triple omni wheel robot where you are trying to take three different angles alpha 1 alpha 2 and alpha 3 what is alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 this actually determines the turn each wheel takes all right so if you are trying to consider all the three wheels uh, inside the kinematics this will become your homogeneous equation a homogeneous uh, matrix from which you will be able to predict the individual velocities now the next kind of robot 
is a generic omni wheel robot now what do i mean by a generic omni wheel robot here in this example we have four wheels now this generic omni wheel need not essentially have four different wheels alone you you can even have five wheels 10 wheels depends upon how you design the robot but if i have anything you know some some arbitrary number of uh, omni wheels they which are positioned and oriented relative to the center of gravity now your robot will have the center of gravity here and you are placing all the four wheels in such a way that they are all relative to the center position then we call it a generic omni wheel now when do we go with this kind of a robot when you are more focused about the stability of the robot why why don't you place uh, this wheel here you know below the base you can still place but when you place there the stability of the robot is at stake so this is one you know uh, generic approach that we use in order to have a very good stability for the robot so with supposing we have three or more independently actuated wheels always remember all these robots that we are talking about so far are all independently actuated wheels by saying independently actuated wheels i mean that one wheel's motion is not dependent on the other wheel's motion each wheel has an individual motor attached with it and that decides at what speed the wheel has to move so you actually have i mean at least this this robot actually has a full motion control in all the degrees of freedom so whatever degrees of freedom you have right now you have along x and along Why? So you can actually move along two axes. Now, if you have four or more wheels, if, as you have four or more wheels, you will come up with multiple solutions. Now, what is multiple solution? Here again, we have a homogeneous matrix for transformation. Then it tries to take. Now, the number of columns is not known because if I have n number of wheels, you will have n number of columns as well. and each wheel is going to have its own movement its own velocity each wheel has an angular velocity that allows the robot to move along x and y axis so there is a speed at which it going to move along x there is a speed along uh, y axis and apart from that the overall angular turn that the robot makes now one thing that you need to be clear is there is an angle at which all these individual wheels move all these individual wheels turn now that is different from the over turn okay that is why we have four omegas representing the angle at which the individual uh, wheels turn and one common omega for the entire robot i hope i'm making it clear now when you look at this four wheel robot now there is something extra here what have we discussed always we have discussed about r which is corresponding to the radius of wheel and most of the time we only go with the same size uh, wheels on all the four sides or n number of wheels now uh, l was actually the distance between the two wheels now what happens because i have four wheels here i have one l value which corresponds to your x axis and one l value which corresponds to the y axis so in y axis i will have a difference or a, a distance between the center and the uh, wheel along y axis and same way center of gravity to uh x direction along the x axis you have a separate l so remember i will have two l values when it comes to the generic omni wheel uh, kind of a robot now the next kind of robot is actually a four wheel steering now this gets a little uh, complex i i will not complicate it with too much of mathematics but we need to understand uh the basic uh concept of how this four wheel steering works now what, what happens here is apart from the four wheels that we have had already we had the four wheels of generic omni wheel the same kind of structure is actually repeated here as well but what happens here is this vehicle has four wheels 
which can all be driven and steered independently now what happens it is not driving alone this has a steering mechanism also steering mechanism actually helps you to turn the wheels as well earlier all these wheels were mounted at one particular direction each along one direction and you cannot change it okay you cannot you cannot turn turn the wheels to a different orientation but the wheels rotation is going to help you to turn the overall robot whereas now if you see the steering mechanism will actually help you to turn the wheel towards one side and that way you can you can make uh, a this is this is like a bicycle model we call it a bicycle model why because your front wheel is going to act as a steering right so when you when you actually steer your front wheel your back wheel act Now you have been muted by someone now. Yeah. OK, so now what happens? We have R, R as a radius. Now we have R and F. Uh, in order to say, we will have a reverse and a forward uh, mechanism. Now, how this reverse and forward, uh, forward I'll tell you. Suppose. Um, this is for a front steering of the same model right so what happens here is these two wheels are going to be steered which means what uh, in in cars you have front steering so your your steering is going to actually act on the front two wheels isn't it so what i'm going to do is assuming that the rear wheel uh, rear wheel is not steered which means it is just following the front wheels uh, steering now what happens is the forward velocity v and the angular velocity w alone will be uh, uh, calculated based upon the x axis uh, uh, the transformation that you make x axis movement uh, the velocity uh, that happens uh, in the x axis alone will be taken for consideration now we have zero side slip these are different movements that you would have uh, we will be actually seeing all that in the simulation today now uh, before going into simulation just understand the terminologies and then we will see how to actually work on it so i guess you understand forward steering where you're just steering the front wheel alone rear, rear wheel is just moving based upon how you steer the front wheels now zero side slip is both front and rear wheels are actually steered but in opposite angles now what happens when forward wheel is actually steered along one direction and along one angle the reverse actually the rear wheel is actually steered in the opposite angle now what would happen now you will have a lateral velocity in the y direction alone okay so this actually is in order to avoid the side slip uh, supposing you know where if you drive a car if you drive a vehicle you understand how to actually avoid a slip especially when you uh, drive on a hilly area right so when when actually both the wheels are steered at opposite angles you avoid skidding or the side slip now the parallel steering is if you have front and rear wheel steered equal with with equal angles now the vehicle starts moving in an uh, angular I mean, there is an angular mo movement which means you will start rotating so when the parallel steering is available you will have uh, the the rotation of the robot at 360 degrees so it starts uh, it starts revolving around so now what uh, what i would uh, talk about next is actually this is the maximum uh, 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 robot configuration that i will be talking today so with that i will be finishing this presentation we'll go for the demonstration so don't worry about the mathematics here uh, uh, the mathematics here is just for your understanding that each model has a different forward kinematics and a different inverse kinematics and also remember that the 
parameters that we have also differs depending upon how how we uh, design the robot so now the four wheel mechanism is actually you are going to drive all the four wheels okay so you, you are you are having a steering mechanism for all the four wheels at the same time so this has a maximum complexity and you will actually go ahead with uh, forward and inverse kinematics of course the terminologies that we are using here is the same thing uh, that we have discussed for the four wheel steering as well so now what i'll do is uh, i am just going to show you this toolbox in fact i'll also give you this link okay so i've i've just pasted this link in the chat box now what uh, i want you to do is uh, i guess i assume that most of you are starting to work with robotics so anybody who starts working with robotics should first understand the different types of robot how it moves when the design configuration changes the entire calculation changes and that actually uh, changes the entire movement of the robot so in order to understand that i would strongly recommend everyone to please download this particular uh, toolbox which is available for free it doesn't come inbuilt with uh, the uh, matlab uh, this was developed by someone and it is actually available in github for download so what i have done is i've already uh, i mean i've already downloaded it all that you would get is a zip file so when the moment i click i mean some some dialog box appears like this so you will just get a zip file what i have done is i have already uh, downloaded extracted the file and it is available in my matlab folder okay so inside my matlab folder now let me show you after extraction as well yeah so once once i've extracted i have uh, don't bother about uh, st joseph day one and all that these are some matlab examples that i showed you in the uh, previous days so apart from that you will have after extracting the uh, files from your toolbox you will see start mobile robotics to uh, simulation toolbox this is this is an m file okay m file is a matlab script file so you uh, we are trying to open this uh, m file into matlab which i have already opened it here okay so this is the first file that you are supposed to actually execute when you download this toolbox why because they have all the functions all the examples available in different folders now as i showed you here the examples are available here the source codes are available here so all these simulink models are pre built available in, uh, for you to actually even add on few sensors that we use very frequently in a robot all these are pre built available so what we have to do is just run this particular uh, you know mobile robotics simulation toolbox once you run that uh, what is available inside it is just adding all these uh, files that you have inside the examples folder inside the source folder inside the documentation folder all that are actually uh, added up to your default path okay the current uh, the current path so once it is added it actually starts the getting started uh, mlx file mlx file is actually a live script so that you can actually execute uh, one by one okay so what what i try to do here is now once i execute this gets opened this is my live script now here you will see links to all the models that i have now what i am trying to do is right now we have discussed about the various kinematic models isn't it so uh, we have already discussed on uh, we have already discussed on the differential drive uh, uh, model 
right? So if I click on to the differential, right? Now, this is the diagram that I've shown you today. Now, what you see here is the forward and inverse kinematics equation, right? So all these are for you to read on. And now, starting ahead, I am trying to give the values for R and L. What is R and L? We know already the radius of wheel and the length. So wheel base length. So these two are actually given in meters. Now I'm calling for a differential drive. This is what you did yesterday. Now I'm trying to set my forward kinematics uh, in order to understand what is going to be the velocity and the angular velocity, V and omega. Now these two are automatically calculated. Now we try to actually find out the inverse kinematics. What is inverse kinematics? Whatever V and omega that we have found out there, we are trying to give those values for the inverse kinematics in order to understand what is my uh, L and I mean omega L and omega R, which is my uh, uh, angular velocity and the linear velocities of your uh, left wheel and the right wheel. So now this we have already done yesterday. So we are not going to do this today. But what I want you to do is being electrical and electronics engineers, I guess most of you are from that stream. You would have already used Simulink, I believe. Simulink, uh, if, if you have already used Simulink, you would understand this. Let me, before going ahead, let me just know uh, if you've used Simulink earlier. How many of you have used Simulink earlier? OK, good. So there are quite a few students. OK, so those who say no, uh, don't worry about it. We are actually. Uh, going to represent the entire program in form of a model, right? So uh, I, I'm trying to open the differential drive kinematic simulation now in Simulink for us to actually see how this model is going to function. Now, so far, what we have done is we have been trying to actually develop uh, a program write some piece of code in order to uh, make it functional. Isn't it? So we, we tried a yes. OK. OK. So one second, let me try to open. OK, so what you see here is I have uh, the models available. Now, these are some existing models from this particular toolbox. Now, what I mean by uh, the existing model is I've, uh, we have discussed about four different uh, models today, like differential drive, uh, triple omniwheel, the generic omniwheel, four-wheel steering, and four-wheel mechanism as well. So supposing I have a differential drive robot, OK? Let me open this up. Now, when you open up a model, you will start looking at the smaller uh, information about it, You know, the, the minor information about it. What is required in order to actually work with a differential drive robot? You will require a forward kinematics model. You will require an inverse kinematics model. You will require a simulation in order to see how your differential drive works. And then you also have a Simscape a multi -mo uh, multi-body model. So now what happens here is, if you look at this, you see that there is a wheel speed and the overall body speed here. Right. So for the differential drive forward kinematics, what is the equation? I mean, what is the function that we had? We are giving vehicle uh, uh, vehicle details like uh, omega L and the omega R. 
isn't it so when you give these two now you are you are giving the wheel speed uh, each wheel speed is actually given as an input and the end output is going to be the speed of the overall robot in terms of uh, for linear and the angular velocity so the output becomes the overall body speed right so each model uh, whatever function you have inside forward kinematics is now represented as a model here that is that is what is a simulink uh, 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 model we call it a simulink model where you don't see the entire code inside you will just see what are going to be the input and what is it that you are going to get as an output suppose i have the differential drive kinematics i can actually take this model's output and connect it to some other model okay so that this is this is how your uh, uh, simulink models are going to help now suppose you look at the environment okay this is this is how you define the various kinematic models and these are the models that are available for your environment now what you see here is uh, uh, in the environment will i have uh, some some you know detector some sensors uh, the one which is going to detect a robot the one which is going to detect a object and then you also have a multi robot environment so whatever environment you want to set up all those environments are available as a model so you can actually plug and play the models depending upon what you require right now when you look at the utilities again now these are various utilities let us not bother about the utilities right now we're not uh, trying to use that we will try looking at the kinematic models and the environments so just remember these models are available from the library that we have uh, from the toolbox that we have downloaded like that for any robot almost almost for all the robots the models are available in github so those who are not really concerned about the design of the robot and you are only concerned about developing the application and making the robot work okay to see how it works then you don't have to break your head on all these kinematics and the environment it, you can just plug and play all these so now we have the differential drive uh, uh, kinematics available like a model here okay now what what i am trying to do is i am not going to execute this instead i will actually go ahead with a triple omni wheel because differential drive we have already tried right so we will actually look at okay now if you see this is the model that is available for the differential drive model now what you have is a differential drive inverse kinematics we just saw the model now what we have is the differential drive inverse kinematics had some value as an input isn't it what is the input going i mean going to be there for the differential inverse kinematics you are going to have the linear velocity and the angular velocity now linear velocity is having some value and the angular velocity is having some value now can i change the velocity and see how uh, you know the robot's movement changes it is possible now during run time i have a slide bar all these are components of simulink so i'll i'll just have a component of simulink a slide bar kind of an uh, 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 utility here so to just vary the values of the linear velocity and the angular velocity depending upon where the slide bar is it is going to take the value the output of this slide control as an input to the angular velocity and the output of this control is going to be the value for linear velocity now the values given here goes in as an input to differential drive inverse kinematics now the inverse kinematics equation is already there the functionality is already pre built what is going to be there as an output your wheel speed now the wheel speed is going to be uh, sent to the differential drive simulator right and your forward kinematics also is calculated here 
which will give you the body speed now all these are the scope operators here wherein you will see on display saying what is the body speed right now what is the pose right now what are the wheel speeds the left wheel and right wheel speed and we also have a robot visualizer in order to see a graphical representation of the robot so now what i'm going to do is just run this piece of code i mean not the code just the simulink model okay so now you see uh, the robot keeps moving okay that red line actually denotes the orientation right so it actually denotes the orientation now what happens is the robot keeps moving at a linear velocity there is a linear velocity that we have initially set as 0.1 and the angular velocity is 0.5 now you see the output of just increase this yeah so the output whatever after performing the forward kinematics what are the body speeds which is the uh, uh, linear velocity and the angular velocity both are actually given as a value here right now what you see here is because the linear and the angular velocity that we have given as an input here is a constant i have not varied your forward kinematics is still giving you the same value right now it is a constant it keeps moving at a constant speed right now uh, if you look at the pose pose is what your x, x x and y coordinates which represents the position information and theta is actually the angle now what happens as it moves you see that the value of x y coordinate changes and the theta actually represents the angle at which it keeps moving right the wheel speeds the left wheel speed and right wheel speed is represented here so the left speed left, left wheel speed is actually less and that is why it is actually turning inwards okay so now what we'll do is in order to look at the simulation i am trying to change the angular velocity now see what happens when the angular velocity changes the uh, robot starts moving at a different angular velocity which means the angle at which it moves is totally changed now you can uh, you can increase or decrease the a uh, linear velocity and see whether at what speed it changes now what you see here is when it moves to the positive side it actually moves in a forward direction when it is a negative value it starts moving in a reverse direction okay so how how do you identify whether it is forward or reverse based upon that red line uh, that denotes your uh, the pose the posture okay so the forward and reverse is determined by the linear velocity the angular velocity tells you whether you want to move towards a clockwise or an anti clockwise are you all clear with this any doubts so far any doubts uh, shall we go for the next model okay okay so now uh, as i told you we also have a triple uh, omni wheel robot now when you have a triple omni wheel robot i'll just open up the simulation here okay now what you see here is in in the earlier robot we just had one linear velocity and one angular velocity now in the triple uh, triple wheel you will have a linear velocity along x axis and y axis and that's what we discussed here okay so because there is vx 
and vy so we have two linear velocities and one angular velocity based on which your robot is going to function now now what happens here these three uh, values are going to be fed as an input to my triple omni wheel inverse kinematics why this triple omni wheel i cannot use a differential drive inverse uh, kinematics here because your transformation matrix will be totally different from what we had for uh, the uh, differential drive kinematics so depending upon what model i use i will have to opt for that particular kinematics uh, inverse kinematics and uh, forward kinematics so we are trying to now look at this so i am i am just changing the x velocity alone the linear velocity of x alone is changed okay so when linear velocity of x changes it it does a change it it brings in a change along one axis alone so it, it instead of start instead of moving here it started moving Uh, uh at a different location suppose i change y okay so what you see here is when i changed x the robot started moving upwards and when i change y the robot started moving leftwards so you see that when i change the x Uh, uh linear velocity or the y linear velocity there is a change in x and y axis accordingly now when i change the angular velocity the turn is what you know at it at what angle it turns differs so when the angle is very less you will have a huge circle and when the angle is high you will have a very closed circle okay so now why do you use all these models is the next question so uh, before going into that we we'll just see the differential drive is over triple okay uh, four wheel steer alone we we will just have a look at the four wheel steer alone and then probably we'll start moving on to the next part okay so in the four wheel steer we have the velocity and the uh, uh, angular velocity uh, which are represented here now remember uh, i i am actually trying to steer okay so the steering is available the four wheel steering is actually available here i am only changing the linear velocity here now what you understand here is yeah so we have the body speeds here okay the steering angle is available for both uh, the four wheel steering simulation and the forward kinematics now for all these you have some uh, you know uh, the uh, how how the steering actually works okay when you change the steering velocity what happens uh, i mean the steering angle then what happens to the Uh, entire movement of uh, the robot so that can be visualized here so there's nothing uh, uh, different here except for the uh, kinematics uh, equation and what inputs that you are going to give so please remember depending upon how you design your robot the equations or the models that are required to build applications has to vary all right okay so 
we will stop all the kinematic models now let's go back to uh, the sensor models okay now the interesting part here is suppose i use a lidar sensor what what is a lidar sensor basically it actually emits some light and it uh, it actually tries to visualize seeing whether it uh, how much amount of light uh, we we are able to send and then how long it takes to uh, reflect back so based upon that i should be able to identify the distance between the obstacle or some object and the robot okay so we are trying to identify okay so what i want to show you here so now remember now what we have done here is uh we are taking an example map uh this is the map that you have already used yesterday okay so right now we are saying the pose is at one particular position what, what do you have as a pose you will give a xy coordinate and then the orientation xy coordinate is given so the robot is placed at that particular location with a given pose and then i am i am actually calling the vis uh, vis is actually a robot visualizer Uh, so it actually calls up the visual, uh, visualizer in order to show me uh, how the map looks like now what we have here is i am trying to use a uh, 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 lidar and i am trying to say at this particular position okay at this particular position uh, i am going to emit lidar and see how far uh, the uh, lidar is going to go so what will happen from here when the lidar goes it goes until a specific uh, range and after that because there is an obstacle beyond that your lidar is not going to work so can i actually get the ranges this is this is how we actually develop a physical robot a uh, normally when you use a robot we use an ultrasonic sensor or a lidar in order to actually find out where the obstacles are now what is interesting here is you don't have to procure any sensor the lidar model is already available the sensor model is already available with us now this is the simulink model now what we have been discussing so far is whether i can just have a model instead of writing a piece of code can i actually take this model now what is this model going to take take in the pose right now where the robot is okay take in the pose and then the lidar sensor's functionality is already available inside this model the output of the model is going to give me the range what is going to be the range the distance from the robot to the obstacle so this is more of a plug and play model now we will just open up this lidar sensor and the uh, object detector blocks now see how the model looks like now what happens here is now see i have some generic vehicle okay or if you want a differential drive uh, robot now all that i would do is instead of this uh, instead of this model i will delete this and then bring in my differential drive model and feed in with the linear velocity and the angular velocity remember differential drive model also will be using only those two as the input okay so you can use whatever model is required now what happens you are feeding in with the same linear and angular velocity goes inside some vehicle simulation and then it the posture of that vehicle is taken as an input to the lidar okay now once the lidar is available you also have something called the objects so you are trying to set up an environment saying where all the objects are available now what is what is this uh, when i define the objects uh, so far we have been defining saying 
the first two values in this object is going to be the x and y coordinate which means the position in the map when i place some object on the map saying it is an obstacle or there is some object then i will be mentioning the position so here the first two columns are representing the position alone the third column is something that categorizes the objects now remember i am going to place some objects in the environment wherever i am going to move i have a map already and over the map i am specifying the location and i am going to place some objects now there are three categories of objects i uh, probably i will represent it using different colors or i will represent it using different shapes it could be some three different labels so i say that the first kind of label is available or the first kind of object is available in 2 comma 8 this is my x y position and then the second object which is under the class 1 okay so the first kind of object i have two different objects two two number of objects of the same class and then two objects of class 3 is available the first is available in 3 comma 7 and the second is available in 8 comma 4 then there are two objects of class 2 again their locations are available so remember when i mention the objects when i try to define the objects on my map i give both the location and the label of it now this goes into the object detector okay what do i mean by object detector now this is one sensor and this is another sensor i have told you about the lidar sensor alone which uses light in order to identify the ranges now let us see now see what you have in the simulation here is i said there are three types of objects here now you see three types of objects which are represented in three different colors okay so i have three types of objects now now what i need to do is i have a lidar sensor here the lidar sensor is going to give me the distance okay so what i have is probably there are some fixed number of lidar rays that are going and each ray is going to give me a range so what you have to see is depending upon the ranges uh, the ranges is going to be available as a variable here and it is also displayed as the values here so you see seven seven different values and all these seven values keep changing depending upon where it falls on the object okay so what happens when there is no obstacle at all when when it keeps going and then it does not reflect back okay you you get a not not a number okay when it is when it is actually moving far beyond uh, uh, what you can track in that case you are you are not going to uh, see Uh, the the value that gets returned so that becomes not a number whenever there is an obstacle the value actually the the lidar actually senses it and then tries to understand there is an obstacle at this particular distance now the second sensor that we have is actually the object detector okay so the object detector is actually going to find out there is an object at this particular place so what what it tries to identify is the distance between the range uh, or the distance between the robot and the particular object okay so first thing is it tries to identify whether it is an object if it is an object then it tries to find the range and at, at, at what angle it is available from the current uh, uh, position okay so that is why it tries to take the pose of the robot the current pose of the robot depending upon the current pose of the robot it tries to change the uh, or it tries to calculate the orientation or the angle at which the object is available and uh, the third one is the label it also tries to identify whether it is a red object whether it is a blue object or a green object how how does it represent taking in the label okay so it represents one two or three depending upon uh, what object it has detected uh is it clear any doubts so far
Okay, so we have completed the four wheels here. The lidar also. <coughs> okay, so now we we also have something called a robot uh, detector. Now what we have here is when I have a multi-robot visualization. Now this is this is a very recent problem that we have. Uh, where more people are working towards swarm robots. Okay, swarm robots is, uh, there can be multiple robots which are going to do a work together. Okay, so if you look at the applications, if you look at the application, there are, there are different applications, uh, uh, you know, uh, that I can state. One is, for a single task, you can use multiple robots, multiple robots doing a single task, which means, suppose I have a huge uh, payload, okay, a huge weight or a huge uh, 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 carton of box that is available, and you want the robot to move. Now, what you would see is you uh, one robot, uh, supposing it cannot move the entire carton of box, then you will require multiple robots coming together and pushing one single load towards the orientation that is required. Okay, so now when when multiple robots come forward, work together in order to do one single task, I should know where uh, each robot is currently present. And what is the orientation of each robot? So they should be able to communicate with each other and they should get to know where the other robots are. This is one application. The second application is there could be one task which can be actually distributed among multiple robots. That also is possible. So when there is a huge task, one task can be distributed among multiple uh, robots where uh, Supposing inside a, a factory, in uh, moving an object from one place to a location two becomes uh, a, a work of one robot, and then the robot one actually leaves the package at a location two, and then the robot two comes, picks it up from location two, and moves it to location three. So here, moving is actually distributed uh, across various uh, robots. So in either cases, we should be able to visualize multiple robots. So what we have here will be, I will have a robotic occupancy grid, which actually tries to help me to understand how the robot is actually distributed across the entire uh, map. So I will have a grid which actually represents uh, the position of each and every robot. Okay, so I'll, I'll directly go to the uh, visualization part. Okay, so now what happens? Okay, I'll, I'll just run it first. Okay, so what you see here is, you, you see that inside the same map that we have been using yesterday, uh, we, are, we have now deployed three different robots. Okay, now when I have three different robots, see what happens when two robots come closer, they understand that there are uh, uh, two different robots and then automatically it changes the orientation in such a way that it avoids collision between the robots. Okay, so this is something that we would want when multiple robots are working inside one single environment. Now, what we have done here is, uh, see, when, when this is a closed loop control, 
okay uh, I, i guess you you know what a closed loop control is but for those who don't understand what it is i'll just give a very brief introduction uh, right now it is actually taking the position of uh, a robot now we have used differential drive robots now what you see here is three differential drive robots available all these three differential robots are going to do uh, are are going to sense the environment how will it sense the environment it will sense using lidar this is what we we were discussing in the previous example where we used a lidar sensor so we are trying to use a lidar and three sensors are available for all the three robots that we have now the posture is taken from the differential drive robot to visualizer and the lidar is going to check the obstacles available and then pass on the information to the visualizer now these two are going to go with the visualizer now the there is one common uh, uh, thing between these two i mean between these three they all have some uh, uh, value or some orientation um, sorry not the orientation the positioning inside the map as x and y which is common inside the same map right so the ranges uh, where the obstacle is is actually passed on to the obstacle avoidance logic the obstacle avoidance logic what it will do is it takes the posture of the uh, robot the distance from the robot to the obstacle any object for that matter it could be a wall or it could be a uh, another robot so whatever it may be it tries to understand the distance between the robot and the object when it gets closer when it gets closer in the sense beyond a certain threshold that we set if we set i don't want the obstacle within 0.5 meters or i don't want i can accept the obstacle until 0.25 meters it is up to us so we we try to see the current posture the range and then decide upon because the obstacle is there it takes the opposite orientation now because the obstacle is towards the right it takes the left orientation so depending upon the current course so which means it takes in the output of the robot and feeds in as a feedback uh, uh, back to the robot again to decide uh, what ang uh, what angles or what movement it has to take so it is actually a feedback control okay uh, taking back the value as a feedback and then deciding upon how to move so this will be a good example for a multiple robot environment uh, wherein you can actually right now it only takes in the value uh, only takes into the consideration of the obstacle alone we can even take into consideration the object so what you can do is you can even place objects here in the environment and see how it behaves yeah so i'll stop this so uh, now when you see the robot detector now this i showed you you know the way i showed you as a model alone in order to see whether there is a robot or not now when you look at the properties of the robot detector model you see that there are uh, multiple uh, properties okay so the first one is the robot index so what we saw here was in the model we had three robots so each model will be represented by a unique index you cannot actually use the same value for multiple robots and then you are uh, representing the offset the detector offset uh, to be 0, 0, which means uh, how, how close uh, you have to get to in order to uh, detect the presence of a robot and the same way at what angle it has to detect okay now the field of view is I, I i hope okay well again play this
Okay. Now the field of view is when it tried to detect the uh, robot. The field of view is you know at at a certain angle. Okay. So the maximum angle at which you can. So the maximum angle at which you can sense the presence of another robot is actually pi by three. Maximum could be pi uh, because uh, your your maximum sensing range is only zero to pi. So you will have uh, pi as the maximum value. Anything below that, uh, you can restrict it. Okay, and then the maximum range are uh, until what length you can uh, detect. Okay, so if you want to increase, you can increase. You, if you want to wait until it gets closer, uh, in such a way that I told you a little uh, earlier, if you can, uh, if you want to modify uh, the range at which you want to detect some uh, object or an obstacle, you can vary all that as the parameters uh, that are given here in the uh, Simulink model. So. Why I am introducing you to the Simulink model is nowhere you see any piece of code. Okay, unlike the functions here, you know both are actually working similarly. Now what we have here is uh, some coding that is required. If someone who is good at coding, you can actually try up code. But Simulink, if you are uh, if you know how to use Simulink, this is the easiest way of developing mobile app. I mean, robot robotic applications. So uh, try and use these. And for each model, please right click onto the model in order to see the properties of each model to understand what all it accepts and what all you can change. Anything that is uh, uh, that can be modified in in the code can also be done in the Simulink model. So I guess I'll stop there. Uh, these are the fundamental applications that you any anyone uh, any beginner can start working with. So try working uh, with all these. So I'll stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be ready to take it up. Ma'am, so we are glad to have. Uh, we are we are very proud to have you as our guest lecture for all the three days, ma'am. So we will be. Thank can you. we have a Q and A session for five five minutes, ma'am? Yeah, we can. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Guys, any queries regarding these uh, topics, you can proceed it in the chat box. Don't turn on your don't turn on your microphones. And all of you, please wait. There is an important thing to be discussed with you all. Ma'am, there is a question that it, yeah, it's yeah master and slave. Yeah, ma master and slave robot. You can very well do it. Now, uh, how how you will do it is. Uh, we had a simulator, you know, the multi-robot simulator. Like that, you will actually design two robots. Okay, you will have uh, uh, two. Supposing you just take a differential drive robot, uh, name it as one and two, and uh, the the movement, uh, you the second robot should always keep track of the first robot's movement and uh, take that as a feedback to robot two and. Give give the path planning uh, or the uh, forward and inverse kinematics equation to follow up the position of uh, the first robot. So that becomes your master and slave uh, slave robot. Guys, any other queries regarding the topics? So we will be waiting for waiting for With three more. Five minutes. axis control. Yeah, you can. You, you can very well do that. Uh, uh, Gopinath has asked if we can develop a five axis control robot. Uh, you can very well do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, please follow the uh, instructions that I had given on day one. Uh, so, all that you need to do is just the design part of it is uh, what you will have to take care of. And then you can create rigid bodies in whatever axis and whatever joints you want. So thanks a lot, ma'am. 
now abhirami ma'am will be giving the vote of thanks ma'am please abhirami ma'am yes thank you dhanush yes uh, honorable dr m m ramya ma'am professor uh, center for automation and robotics hindustan institute of science and technology and for all the participants and it is my privilege to have us to present our thanks for the training on robotics and myself p agirami assistant professor on behalf of triple uh, department and uh, st joseph institute of technology and coordinators and actually a very hearty vote of thanks to ma'am for sharing her valuable knowledge on robotics with us for, uh, by their thought provoking presentations and also i thank her for accepting our request and presented wonderful robotics for all the three days in all over the world gratitude to our chairman directors and principal for providing encouragement and support i am very grateful to our students for giving us an opportunity to organize this online training on the development of robotics using matlab and my hearty thanks to all the participants participate for their active participation in this program and once again i thank all the participants and the ma'am thank you ma'am yeah thank you so much for the opportunity uh, uh, dr abirami and uh, thank you of uh, all the participants for your uh, patient listening and i hope i uh, the program is of some use to you uh, if if for even a single person if it had helped to develop uh, something towards robotics i'll be uh, very happy yeah thank you so it was a wonderful session ma'am and uh, everybody given the very nice feedback ma'am about uh, the training okay. session and uh, thank thanks you. a lot ma'am for accepting our uh, thank session. you thank you so much yeah. thanks a lot ma'am from uh, from all of them from central of institute of technology and department of electrical and electronics engineering so meeting you soon at, at another webinar ma'am thanks a lot ma'am